So uh, my background, I'm a physician, as Saran said. I uh, trained in physiology and epidemiology, as well as chest medicine and preventive medicine. And I got interested uh, about 20 years ago in applying, interested in basically genetic susceptibility to exposures, um, like cigarette smoking and lung cancer, um, in terms of modification of risk. Why do only more, one in four people smoke get lung cancer for a lifetime risk? Um, and smoking was a good model to use because unless you worked for a tobacco company, there was incontrovertible evidence for this exposure and the disease. Um, if you had poor evidence for an exposure, postulated exposure disease relationship, you're, you have too many variables in motion. So for a while, for example, uh, there was a postulated relationship between uh, long-acting organochlorines like DDT and breast cancer, but actually the, pr the primary exposure relationship was never proven, so any genetic modification would be sort of meaningless. So we started doing lung cancer risk about 25 years ago. Most of that work's been folded into a big consortium where we're looking at uh, genetic modification of, uh, of uh, cigarette dose, cigarette type, et cetera. I got more interested then in, in survival and in, in clinical characteristics, clinical epidemiology, if you will, uh, after doing a large case control study. So now I do case only. And around 19, let's see, that was in 1992. Um, and no one was interested in studying lung cancer. I was at Mass General and at Harvard at that time because everyone said, oh, smoking causes it. We know the cause, we know the solution. Why do you want to study it? Well, because I was interested in these interactions. So for about from 92 until 2004, we built up quite a large case population and some controls as well. And um, a good friend and colleague uh, who had been recruited to MGH a few years before, uh, Tom Lynch, who was head of thoracic oncology, uh, was doing a study uh, that was funded by a drug company on gefitinib in late stage salvage therapy for lung cancer. Uh, he had a relatively small series, but a fairly dramatic response in a lot of these, some of these people. However, the protocol did not include any genetics. They only had clinical data. So Tom called me one day and said, you know, uh, <laughs> I'm sure your protocols got, uh, your observational protocol has most of our patients in it, and you're proved to have to do genetic studies, both on uh, tumor tissue and on blood. Let's put our heads together and see if we can get something out of this. He was specifically did not have any permission to do genetics in the clinical protocol, but we had it in my protocol. And that was fortuitous for all of us, particularly for Tom, because that led to the New England Journal article, case series from Mass General, on EGFR mutations and TKI inhibitors um, across town. Our colleagues in this, in, still in Harvard, but at Dana-Farber with a very different population, the Japanese population were, were studying because um, they didn't have permission to do any genetics in their studies either, but they got a Japanese population. That was the science article. That was a companion article in the same week. Um, so, of course, that, the story of the tumor mutation has taken off since then and targeted drugs based on mutations. I felt a little vindicated from all those years of people saying, who wants to study lung cancer? <laughs> Why are you collecting all this stuff? It's so much trouble. You have the 24-hour coverage for all your freezers and blah, 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 but, uh, but Tom was wonderful to work with and the rest of the team, and um, we felt we made uh, an impact there. Um, so since then, um, not to compete with my molecular pathologist friends, we've been interested in sort of, okay, there are a number of people, four or five percent of adenocarcinomas that have specific targetable mutations, maybe a few more. Um, but what about the just vast majority of non-small cell cancer? What about predictors of outcome for the non-targetable folks? And that's what I've been spending a lot of time um, recently. So of course the impact might be different, the implications might be different as far as um, targeted versus other kinds of therapy, standard therapies. Um, but we've been very interested in looking at we started doing a GWASP, germline, did not show a lot, but it showed some sort of suggestions for survival. We keep calling it a survival, it's really outcome and survival. But then started to build on platforms. So GWASP was not that great, but it showed a few hits in the HIF gene, it's a hypoxia-induced factor, and some of my basic scientists were interested in that because they've been studying it for years in tumor behavior. Then we did um, methylation, 
Um, and then we're adding um, other platforms like metabolomics on it. So today I'm going to talk about the methylation part that came out of uh, uh, GWAS and methylation and uh, gene expression data. So that's what we meant by multi-omics, multi-platform, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we just look at it as an integrated analysis with all available data from different points of view. Um, so everything I'm talking about today is, uh, is from uh, NCI grants. Um, I have no other disclosures. So non-small cell, and I keep saying non-small cell, most of you might know lung cancer is broadly broken up into small cell and non-small cell. Small cell is a neuroendocrine tumor, very aggressive, even more recalcitrant than uh, uh, than non-small cell. Non-small cell caught in the early stage can be totally cured. Small cell very rarely cured and doesn't even follow the same staging. It's basically limited versus uh, extensive and metastatic as opposed to the four stages we have in non-small cell. Um, so today is all limited, is confined to non-small cell where we have the be best hit for opportunity for cure. So it's, you know, it's a big epidemic, obviously. We, um, we, it still uh, counts for more deaths uh, than the next two or three most common types of tumors in both men and women. Um, and so it's a leading cause of death in both men and women in the US, a cause of cancer death. And the five-year survival differs by stage, just clinical stage. But even within the early stage, the curable stages, stage one and stage two, there's still um, and now we have stage 1A, stage 1B, stage 2A, 2B, and they differentiate uh, pretty well in terms of five years of survival with the late stage having abysmal five year survival, if one to five percent. If you get targeted therapy, you're gonna be in a little bit better shape for that. So um, we're interested in this case and uh, some of the epigenetic aspects, and I'll explain why and more of that in a minute. Um, but we're very interested uh, today in early stage lung cancer, in improving survival in early stage, because early and late stage really behave differently uh, and the approaches are different. Late stage, meaning three, if you, 3B three three and four, even 3A, 3B and four, is really uh, the approach is gonna be to slow down the tumor, to regress the tumor, to uh, improve survival the way you would with a uh, survival of, let's say, a chronic, another chronic disease like cardiovascular arterial sclerosis, but not cure. Manage, yes. But one and two, we really have a shot for cure, like really cure. Um, epigen we got interested in epigenetics from a mechanistic point of view, but in our looking at the literature, of course, there are some drugs on the market already um, that are targeted towards um, uh, epigenetic modifications, and there are at least two that are used, and not for lung cancer, but uh, used um, in inhibiting uh, DNA methylation in certain conditions. So, so it's not inconceivable that epigenetic <coughs> medications might work their way into certain solid tumors like um, lung cancer. Um, if you look at epigenome-wide association studies, EWAS versus GWAS, um, and uh, you'll see that there, there are some studies, at least, and this is confined to Caucasians right now because that's where our biggest sample size are. Um, there have been some studies that talk about in, uh, alterations in relapse uh, free survival, which is really early stage, progression free survival, later stage. Um, and uh, there have been some subgroups that have been, uh, subgroup methylation signatures that have been associated with um, relapse free survival and overall survival, but the results are inconsistent. Um, and largely inhibited by small sample sizes that inhibit conclusions. Different study outcomes, the outcomes are not that well defined, particularly when you're talking about progression-free survivals, a lot of subjective aspects from the oncologists uh, as, a, uh, as opposed to a hard outcome like survival, time to survival, boom, pretty hard. Death is a hard outcome, not too subjective. And so uh, we use that as our first cut. Um, and. Uh, also, I think some of the literature we saw that was inhibited by sample size, so they didn't break down the subhistologies. So within non-small cell, we have squamous cell, adenocarcinoma, adeno being the most common now, uh, large cell undifferentiated, um, and a lot of the studies just lumped them all together. So I'll show you today that we actually found some histological differences in the markers. We looked at um, some 
uh, epigenetic um, information. We've actually published about three papers in the past year and a half on this. I first got interested in it because a, a, a young, smart junior faculty member at Mass General, Jonathan Wettstein, was very interested in this gene as a KDM pathway. It's a lysine demethylase uh, in, in vitro studies. Seemed to, um, seemed to affect tumor behavior in his lab. And, it, and he, said, he called me once and said, you know, this gene is uh, probably polymorphic in humans. Are you interested in looking at it in your population? Because I have some really good mechanistic data. Uh, and he did, he had very good in, in mechanistic data. And in fact, we got uh, two articles in Cancer Discovery back to back. One was the, uh, the mechanistic piece, um, purely mechanistic piece, and then one that showed that patients in our population, um, variants in the KDM gene seem to affect uh, sensitivity to mTOR drugs. But the effect was small. And the editor said that. They liked the first paper that was purely mechanistic, when they, we added on, they, they published it because it was human, but they said, you know, the effect is not very big. They were right. It wasn't very big. It was not very dramatic. It was like, you know, 10% uh, uh, or something uh, difference in survival. But one of my smart postdocs said, that gene is kind of interesting, and Jonathan's like manipulating it in the lab. Why don't we see what happens when, if it's methylated, just silenced as opposed to the kind of, so, okay. So we looked at that, and it turned out uh, that was in the clinical epigenetics paper we published. If you looked at epigenetic modifications, meaning just methylation of a KDM lysine demethylation, it was a much more dramatic effect on survival than what we saw with the gene variants, the, the, the sort of polymorphisms, not really mutations, just polymorphisms in the, in the gene. So that got us kind of interested, because maybe a lot of the, you don't want to sort of discard it without looking at all aspects of it. So it wasn't really so much the SNPs that were important, it was the methylation of the gene, the silencing of the gene. Uh, and that dovetailed well, well with what Jonathan found uh, was the um, oncogenic properties of the uh, gene in his primary studies. So then we looked at a few others. It was, um, uh, it was uh, looking at GWAS data and TC, using TCA data to uh, validate our findings from our consortium, um, BTD2, which is a B cell translocation gene. We found that epigenetic modification of that was important, and then another leucine-rich repeat containing 3B gene, the LRCC3B. Um, so there are a number of cases where, you, in order to focus on these, we needed to have other data. We needed the, the basic information on function from uh, basic studies and then and translational studies and we needed to have methylation data and in some cases gene expression data and put it all together so you have a functional uh, story and one where the function is altered um, in this case by methylation. So HIF I mentioned came up, HIF 1 and 2 um, uh, and, and in some of our GWAS study is just not super powerful in terms of predicting survival. So the gene that codes for HIF is L, the EGLN, the um, um, EGL9, 1 and 2, um, that codes for the HIF vector in humans. And uh, so hypoxia, of course, is very important in the development uh, and in the behavior of uh, aberrant angiogenesis. Um, and hypoxia promotes stabilization and activation of this protein known as HIF. Uh, there's alpha, beta. It's essential for adapting the cell's oxygen homeostasis to, uh, to hypoxia. Um, and HIF-1 alpha is very specific for the hypoxia response. I was trained as a pulmonary physician, so hypoxia is very close to my heart because uh, it's very important in a number of conditions. Um, so in the normoxic, normoxic state, uh, HIF1 is rapidly degraded by uh, enzymes PDH5. In fact, the EGLN gene, I think, sometimes has been referred to as uh, PhD also. Um, so when hypoxia occurs, the degradation is suppressed, and there are at least three enzymes that, code, that are coded by this one gene that all relate to the hypoxia pathways. And so we looked a little bit more into Eglin, 
and the expression has been found related to be prognosis in a couple of solid tumors, including colorectal, pancreatic, and breast, um, which is quite interesting, but none had been reported in lung. Um, and several studies talked about hypermethylation of the gene that would silence it might reduce DNA expression in colorectal cancer and in breast cancer and, and um, in vitro in a diverse set of malignant cells. So we wanted to look at it in non-small cell lung cancer. So we had uh, four populations and then the fifth T TCGA as valid external validation. So Harvard MGH is mine and from our International Lung Cancer Consortium we um, had uh, a consortium, a subconsortium with Spain that had seven centers, Norway and Sweden. So this is a Caucasian study for the d discovery phase, uh, and then we used the TCGA for the uh, validation. So we had 1,230 early stage, meaning one and two, resectable lung cancers, um, and uh, also uh, were made up of uh, adenos carcinoma and squamous carcinoma from these five international centers. And so we did a two-stage association study to identify uh, prognosis, really overall survival we're talking about. Because prognosis, even that means different things to different people. Uh, it, with the um, studying CPG probes in the Eglin gene. Then we did an integrative analysis of methylation and gene expression from our own data and then looking at TCGA uh, with EGLN and HIF1A. And then we did a gene-gene interaction analysis for this axis. So that's why we call it an integrative axis. You can call it multi-platform, whatever. Main thing is it's integrated. <coughs> so knowing that so many of you are outstanding scientists and are hell-bent on good QC, uh, um, I put a little bit of the workflow in here. Um, so we. Statistically, and, uh, as far as the computational biology, we employed a couple of programs. One was rangers, like two postdocs who are computational biologists and epidemiologists. So it's a weighted version of random forest to look at um, the probes located in the EGLN family. Then they also did something called sliding window sequential forward selection method to identify the uh, top probes. And finally, only after that, we had whittled down to the key probes did we use a multivariate Cox uh, proportion hazard regression model to look at the uh, significance of association between any particular probe and overall survival. Um, so we used the uh, Illumina 450 uh, for our methylation um, platform, worked quite well and has always worked for us. Um, I know there's a denser one out now, but this was done five, four years ago or something. Um, then we did our quality control steps, so background subtraction, normalization, um, we moved low quality probes, we moved low quality samples, there are very few of those, I'll, I can show you some of the data on that, quartile normal, quantile normalization, and then design bias correction for type 1 and type 2 probes, and then finally batch effect corrections. So that was our QC um, flow. You're not going to be able to read these, but um, it uh, just gives distribution by site, uh, the, the uh, consortium sites, and then the uh, TCGA and the combined set for raw data. Um, and um, they, our discovery phase and the TCGA phase are, are, are comparable in terms of age, distribution, demographics, uh, and cell type prevalence, <coughs> adenocarcinoma being the most um, prevalent. This you can't read, but I just want to show you. <laughs> Uh, graphically, again, our QC results, because um, that's obviously very critical. And we did the main analysis is survival analysis, which I'll show you, but we also did a differential analysis. We had a small number of people where we had the tumor, resected tumor, and then had non-involved tissue that was distal to the tumor, same lobe. Um, so it's hard to say it's totally normal, but it's non-involved, uh, distal to the tumor. What we did what we call a differential analysis to see if the tumor um, and adjacent tissue were different. And that data is available in TCGA as well. So, um, so we did both. Most of our focus is on survival. So after QC, we had um, 
discovery set of 617 validation of, uh, 613 validation of 617 and about 34 probes that were located to the EGLN um, gene. In our expression data, we had 328 and the carcinoma data set from TCGA. For a differential analysis, we had 23, uh, 29 of our own adenocarcinoma, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, we had, um, that should say 29 of our own and 57 from TCGA. 29 from our set, 57 from them. So we screened out, when we lose the forward selection method, we screened out four potential probes using Ranger. Um, among adenocarcinoma patients, we identified eight of the top eight and top 10 probes in the discovery phase and validation phase, respectively. Um, this is 3056 and 8006. We're simultaneously in the top list of both phases for adenocarcinoma, <coughs> but not for squamous carcinoma. And then two other probes were identified in squamous carcinoma that were not the same probes. They were different. So histologic subtype and different probes that were carried forward. We did our Cox regression, so this is a standard survival analysis, um, discovery phase and validation phases, and an adjustment for appropriate covariates, age, gender, smoking status, clinical stage. We only were confined to stage one and two, but that's still adjusting for any differences between one and two just by stage alone. And the study center was also uh, put in the model. So we had a Cox proportion hazard ratio defined as per 1% methylation increment that was estimated for each of the probes, the 8 and 10 respectively. And then what those that were statistically significant were retained if they met all of the following criteria, FDR less than 0.05 in discovery, P less than 05 in the validation, and a, a consistent directional effect, because you know you can sometimes get into flip-flopping, which is either random or for other reasons. So we. Um, we did only kept at this consistent direction and met those statistical uh, thresholds. So the model confirmed one probe after really throwing out a lot with uh, QC and with those criteria, and it was a 3056 in Elgin 2 that was significantly associated with survival, but only among the adenocarcinoma patients. Um, those are the hazard ratios in the discovery phase, 1.02, validation phase, 1.02, and combined set 1.02. That's per 1% methylation. So even though 1.02 seems like a small number, it's actually we're 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 2, and 10 to the minus 5 in the <coughs> combined set it's per 1% methylation. So the following analysis are, are just in the adenocarcinoma patients because squamous dropped out. So if you look at the Kaplan-Myers for the 3056, Patients were categorized into two groups, low and high methylation groups based on the median, the actual median, not an arbitrary median of, um, of methylation. And you can see there is reasonable differentiation, um, uh, the low methylation group being in red um, and the um, high methylation group being in turquoise uh, with worse survival. Um, with a hazard ratio of 1.71, the P is 10, 2 times 10 to the minus fifth. That's not bad. Um, that's not bad looking, and these are adjusted for covariates. So that's not actually a small effect. If you look at the 3056 in the second keynote, when you do this, uh, a CART analysis um, with a combined data set, discovery and validation, there were four clusters that uh, were identified with significantly different survival curves on the lower left. Um, and the 3056 was identified as the second most important predictor. Um, those stage one patients with high methylation uh, at 3056 had much worse survival than those with low methylation. So the differentiation between the top and the bottom is pretty significant. Um, so, <clears throat> correlation between 3056 methylation and expression of the EGLN and HF, HIF1 gene expression. Um, you probably can't, I'll read it because you may not be able to see it. So on the left, uh, 3056 methylation and EGLN expression, R is minus 0.36, uh, p-value is uh, 1.5 times 10 to the minus 11th. 
And on the right, EGLN and HF, uh, HIF1A expression, we'd expect these two to be uh, pretty well correlated. Uh, the R is minus 0.3, and the p value is 4 times 10 to the minus 8. So <clears throat> if we look at HIF1A in survival, uh, there were none of the probes for HIF1A was associated with survival as a main effect. But remember, e, the HIF1A is also under control of the EGLN gene. But expression of HIF1A was significantly associated with uh, survival with a hazard ratio over 2 and a p-value of 5 times 10 to the minus 3 on the right. Um, so how about the interactions then between EGLN and HIF1? The expression of EGLN2 was not independently associated with survival, but it had a significant interaction with HIF1A expression on patient survival. Said another way, the probably the, uh, any effect that EGLN2 had on overall survival as far as gene expression was probably mediated through <coughs> HIF rather than independently. So it doesn't, that's why you need to do the multi-platform. It doesn't, you can't throw it out as not, as not important. It's just not necessarily the direct arrow, maybe it's indirect through HIF. So a decreased expression of um, EGLN2, there was an elevated or increased effect of HIF1A expression on adenocarcinoma survival. And conversely, patients with overexpressed EGLN2 did not have any statistically significant uh, effect vis-a-vis -vis HIF1 expression on overall survival. So far as that, the one look we did on differential normal versus or non-involved versus tumor, um, the 3056 in EGLN2 was significantly hypermethylated in tumor tissue. We would have hypothesized that. Expression was significantly downregulated in tumor tissue. We would expect that as well because of the hypermethylation. And HIF1A was significantly uh, upregulated in uh, tumor tissues. So uh, what can we conclude from this? And this isn't published yet, by the way. It's been submitted for review. So we find that it's reasonable to say there might be a pathway that accounts for the, me the mechanism of EGLN involved in tumor survival. Um, why it's only adeno and not squamous, I don't know. That I can't tell you. Hypermethylation of EGLN2, at least at this site, at 3056 site, um, likely suppresses expression as we'd expect and leads to high uh, HIF expression and that results in poor prognosis. So that makes a mechanistic argument pretty well. And epigenetic <laughs> modification, however, of the downstream HIF1 didn't affect survival. It was upstream to EGLN2 that did. However, EGLN2 uh, affects HIF1 expression and that was modified by uh, EGLN expression upstream. So. EGLN2 interacted with um, uh, HIF1A expression, and uh, then they had basically an interactive effect, additive interactive effect on survival. Um, only EGLN2 overexpressed patients had low expression of the HIF1 um, and had a, a much better prognosis. So the, the whole point here, I think, is there's interactions um, and there is. Uh, non-genetic but epigenetic modification going on um, that uh, affects gene expression. So you need to have the epigenetics, you need to have the expression, um, and you need to have the survival characteristics in the population. Again, I can't really explain why it's not showing up in squamous cell other than it's a different histologic subtype, and um, that I would, don't know. And that's a very good, and maybe some other pathways involved um, so what literature would support things like this? Well, in vivo and in, in, in vitro work to confirm that overexpression in EGLN2 can inhibit the stabilization of HIF1A after hypoxia and it, uh, inhibited tumor growth. This is actually a lot of literature. It's not just like a few papers on things like this. And this is a pretty, pretty big literature. And in a, inhibition of uh, HIF activities already become an effective anti-tumor therapy for some tumors, although not 
lung um, and other solid tumors, but it already has been a target for quite a, quite a long time. This is from Nature Reviews in 2003. Um, and then in our hands, the methylation of EGLN2 uh, with effect on, and uh, HIF1 are, uh, could be a potential biomarker for adenocarcinoma prognosis, at least in the early stages. And they may become drug targets um, in lung cancer therapy. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge the team. Most of this work was done by postdoc Wu Yang Zhang, and then um, our bioinformatics group, our statistical group led by um, Shi Hong Lin, who runs our quantitative genomics, um, and uh, my lab director, Li Su, um, and all of the consortium uh, folks from Europe and the US.